I'm Roger Farrell, the Vice Chancellor of Lincoln University. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, this is the, um, the 13th State of the Nation Environment Address, and uh, I think it's become an increasingly significant event, not only for Lincoln University, but for uh, those of you that have attended quite regularly, but uh, uh, in terms of the wider audience, because we've continued to try and address issues that are uh, relevant to uh, the current environment. And uh, in introducing tonight's um, speaker, Professor Bob Evans from the University of Waikato, uh, we have somebody that has um, a significant background in uh, issues that relate to uh, environmental planning, sustainability and development, and related issues. Um, and in addition to that, um, clearly a policy environment. So um, it's a pleasure for me to particularly welcome, I think, uh, the in, a number of Environment Canterbury Commissioners, including the Chancellor, um, uh, to tonight's event. The, um, the issues that we face as a, uh, as a, as a nation are uh, pretty significant at this point, and particularly so, I think, in Canterbury. On the other hand, um, the current Canterbury situation could be seen as a massive opportunity that we need to take, particularly around uh, planning and the way we plan for the future in terms of being environmentally sustainable. Um, we get a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's been a rather hard road over, over the last 12 months in terms of getting to this point. But I think there is an opportunity and we can learn a good deal, I think, from uh, the perspectives of other people. Bob Evans has only been in New Zealand for six months. Um, he's got degrees from at least 5% of the UK universities, uh, um, which is uh, an achievement in its own right. But I, su I suggest to you that that breadth and that experience uh, brings a great deal to, uh, to what we're going to listen to tonight. And it's indeed my great pleasure not only to welcome all of you as the audience, uh, but also to uh, invite uh, Bob Evans to talk to us on fair shares, self-interest and environmental planning. Will New Zealand cope with the challenges of the 21st century? Bob. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Thank you, uh, Vice-Chancellor, Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you've heard, I've only been in New Zealand for uh, six months, so therefore I'm an expert in all things New Zealand. Um, but what I'd like to do tonight is to uh, offer you some thoughts on some of the issues that are going to be, have to be addressed, not only by New Zealand, but by, I suspect, all of the so-called developed modern post-industrial societies in the world. And I have a particular interest in environmental planning, and so I'd like to uh, draw out, if you like, some of the issues that have emerged from this uh, uh, consideration of the future uh, in terms of what's going on in terms of environmental planning. So, that's hopefully my agenda. Will New Zealand cope with the challenges? And before I talk about the challenges, let's just look at that. We can either stumble into the future and hope that it works out all right, or we can try and shape it. And to shape it, we need to know where we want to be and the challenges we must face. <coughs> it seems to me that there's always a real temptation to look at the past and expect that this is going to give us real guidance to the future. And my argument to you tonight is that I think we can no longer rely on the past as a guide to the future. That the changes that are occurring globally now are so substantial, so massive and so unprecedented that we really have to think differently if we are going to meet those challenges. And the, clearly there are a number of challenges that we could consider. Uh, we could consider things like the possibility of global economic meltdown. We could consider the challenges of, let's say, uh, terrorist attack and so on. I'm not qualified to talk about those things. But there are three challenges that I think we should uh, think about and consider when we're looking ahead. He said. Well, there are those three challenges. The challenge of climate change the challenge of volatile and rapid global change that's occurring at the moment, and the challenge of sustainability and the question of fair shares. I'd like to focus more on the second of these and the third, and less on the first, but I do think I need to mention it because of its significance, its importance, in terms of our environment and how we deal with it. 
just to um, just um, just to, to put this in the context, uh, as I'm sure you're very aware, there are many detractors from the idea that the global environment, the global uh, uh, um, warming is occurring. And those two slides, I think, give us some indication of the link between, on the one hand, the rising temperature of the northern hemisphere, but I suspect we have somewhat similar figures here, and CO2 concentrations over the last, let's say, 100 to 150 years, and particularly over the last 50 to 60 years. Massive increases. And the um, evidence, the weight of scientific evidence, I think, shows very clearly that this is due to human activity. It's not something which we can just explain away by natural processes. And quite clearly, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the consequences of this are quite dramatic. If we get a five degree shift, we can see quite massive changes to the world in which we live. And remember, a five degree shift one way, i.e. positive, if we look at it the other way, a five degree negative, we'd be back in the ice age. It's that sub substantial degree of change that we could potentially be looking at. And as you can see, that even if we're looking at a one or two degree change, which is the the level of change which the International Panel on Climate Change expects, then we're looking at quite substantial changes in terms of water, ecosystems, extreme weather events, and so on. Now, I don't propose to go through that in any great detail, but I'd like to place that in the back of your mind, simply because, if you look at that, the projections, we're not looking at something which is a long way ahead. We're potentially looking at something that will affect, I would guess, looking around the room, most people in this room, and certainly the children of most people in this room. So the whole discussion that I'm going to mount here is not about some ill-defined future. I'm talking about the next 15, 20, and probably the maximum 30 years. The changes that we are going to experience are going to be substantial. They're going to come upon us quite rapidly, and they're going to affect generations of people who are alive now. <clears throat> Moving that on. Climate change, as you know, uh, the science is uncertain. Uh, and as you know, I'm sure there are significant geographical variations. Some places may actually be more pleasant places in which to live. I used to uh, work at the university in uh, Newcastle in the UK, which as I'm sure many of you know, is a rather damp, dreary, windswept and cold place. And so consequently, in a meeting such as this, I would say, well, climate change is happening, it's going to get warmer, it's going to rain this. Right, bring it on. <laughs> we want more climate change. Uh, quite clearly, that's not the same situation if you're living in a, in a low lying Pacific Island. Nevertheless, uh, it's quite clear that levels of public understanding about this are quite low. Um, people would, I think, be tempted by the idea that, okay, it's not happening, it's not going to impact upon us, it's something which we can deal with. Okay, the weather seems a bit different now than it was, but maybe that's just, as it were, one of those things. And by and large, this question of altruism and self-interest, something I'll come back to in a moment, is I think quite important. So much of the environmental agenda, and particularly the issues of climate change, are dependent upon our concern for others, as yet unborn others, or to use the phrase, unseen others, people who are living in other parts of the world we never see, but who may uh, suffer the, the worst effects of some kind of uh, climate change. And in a sense, it's quite difficult to get people engaged in this debate. It's quite difficult to get people to take it seriously because it doesn't appear to affect them immediately. And I'm sure when we all think about these things, it's not something that, as it were, is on our day-to-day -day radar. It's something that we might have some general feeling about, that we, we feel it's important, we ought to do something about, and by and large, it's something we can put on the back burner. The next two challenges, I think, are slightly different. Our world is changing rapidly. And if you look at those kind of... Uh, Figures, you know, 65% of the human population has never made a telephone call, a third has no access to electricity, 72.6% of all statistics are made up in the spur of the moment. I mean, <laughs> the, thing about, the thing about statistics is, is that they just give you a general picture, and this is, a, I think, a very important general picture. Two billion people, perhaps a few more now, two and a half billion people are actually in the global economy, in the sense that, you know, they're on the internet, they're they're participating in, in, uh, in, in, in global consumption, they're buying flat screen televisions and Levi jeans and all the rest of it. But a substantial proportion of the world's population, about two thirds, are not in that position. But, as that bottom paragraph states, this is changing rapidly, more rapidly than most of us realise, much more rapidly. So, if we're trying to, as it were, uh, uh, imagine, understand the future, we cannot understand it by looking back over the last 20 or 30 years. 
exponential growth. <laughs> what I'm trying to explain to you here is the possibility that change is occurring at a rate which initially seems quite slow. But in actual fact, by the time we realise that it's actually quite quick, it's too late. So I'd like you to imagine this uh, pond, this very badly drawn pond, with an imaginary lily in the middle. Okay? You have to stretch your imagination a little bit here, suspend disbelief. And imagine that lily doubles its size each day, and imagine it takes 30 days to fill the pond. So this is a mind game, just to, as it were, explain this process of exponential growth. After 10 days, our lily is doubled in size, but it's still not very big. You're a third of the way through the time scale. And after 20 days, two-thirds of the way through, it's still not that much bigger. We're looking at this lily and saying, well, this lily's getting a bit bigger, we ought to do something about it. Because, of course, when you look at the time scale, on the 29th day, it's covering half the pond, and you've only got one more day before that happens. So change can be occurring at a rate which we think we can manage, because our history is one of assuming we can manage the environment, and we can manage change. We can always be in a position of control on these things. Increasingly, we're realising that this isn't the case, and particularly when you recognise that the rate of change may be much more rapid than we think it is, we might be in quite serious trouble. And of course, population is an indicator. I mean, in many ways, you only need one statistic if you want to understand what's happening to the world, and that's this one. That uh, over the last, let's say, 60 years, uh, the population has almost tripled. 1947 is a very important date, because that's where I was born. Uh, 2.5 million, a uh, billion rather, uh, are people in these systems now, and in my lifetime it's going to be seven. Just in one lifetime. And it's a very short lifetime, and it's going to extend a lot longer. Nevertheless, um, a dramatic increase. And then, of course, the population projections, as many of you know, the median projection by 2050 is about nine. Uh, but a recent UN report suggests it might be as high as 14. Now the point about this is, it's not only about food and about water and about shelter, it's about all the other stuff. Somebody said to me the other day, um, people aren't needy now, they're wanting. It's not what you need, it's what you want. You know, I want a Mercedes, I want a black colour television, and all the rest of it. So we're talking about potentially dramatic increases upon the Earth's resources in all sorts of ways. And of course, most of this population growth is not going to be in countries like New Zealand or the UK or much of Europe, is going to be in places like Africa. Most of that is going to be in the so-called developing regions, or the so-called underdeveloped regions, whatever your political perspective is. But that's where the population increases are going to be, and that is where people are going to be demanding more and more, as the demand for better quality food, better quality housing, and so on, increases. And if we put that in the context of places like China, we can see there is quite staggering change. Unprecedented and staggering change. So if you look at this, uh, we're looking between 1990 and 2009, so a period of about 20 years, a 536% change in GDP in China during that period of time, the United States 61%. I mean, it's, it's uh, almost unimaginable. Those of you that have been to China will know uh, that just looking at what's happening is, is so dramatic you can hardly comprehend it. 62 or 72, I can't remember the exact number, new airports currently being constructed. Uh, I was working in a medium-sized city of six million people. Six billion people. Six million. Six million. Six million people. Population New Zealand is four and a half. So in that kind of context, we're looking at numbers, sizes, rates of change, which are almost unimaginable. Now, this isn't to say that China is not entitled to produce a better quality of life for its people. It's not to say that at all. Of course, they're entitled to it. But to recognise that this change will have global consequences and will have consequences on countries like New Zealand. And if you look at this second graph here, uh, you can see that by about uh, 2020, 2019, China is predicted to overtake the United States in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that the United States is going to be poor because you've got centuries of investments in infrastructure and so on and so forth. And China has clearly got to catch up. But nevertheless, the trends are quite startling. Okay, Lehman was three years ago, and of course there have been other financial hits over the last uh, six months or so. But you can see, can't you, the consequences here, that the, uh, as it were, the, the, the shift of the world is moving towards the Pacific Rim, which I suppose is an advantage to countries like New Zealand. But just the, the pure rate of, uh, uh, or rather the, the, the pure extremes here of China maintaining 7 or 8% uh, growth, and uh, Iceland is an extreme, but the UK is down to four. In fact, it's down to north now. Yeah. 
We are living in a completely different world. We can't assume that somehow the Western economies, the, the developed economies, are sort of going to miraculously bounce back. Doesn't seem to be much evidence that that's going to happen, those of you that have been reading the papers today. And then if you look at China, China's on track to quadruple its economy by 2020. Quadruple its economy, every six person in the world, Chinese, 1.3 billion, whatever it is. If China is to drive cars at the same density as Germany, this will mean 650 million new vehicles. The point is, it can't be done. There's not enough raw material in the world. <laughs> Beijing aims to encourage every citizen to eat 200 eggs per year. This is 260 billion eggs and 1.3 billion chickens, if you can imagine that kind of thing. Have a lot of chickens. Now, those two statements are not from some kind of tree-hugging, long-haired, sandal-wearing, green, lefty anarchist. Right? Um, these two statements are from the last head of the United Nations Environment. So it's a serious comment, and it got into a great deal of trouble, uh, or top, or a great deal of trouble from the Chinese government for making this, this statement. Now, you can argue about the details, but again, it's a question of scale, just a pure size of this process. Oil. We've got to talk about oil. The era of easy oil is over, and that's quite clear. Uh, we know that we have either actually reached peak oil in terms of production, or we're about to reach it, or it's, you know, it's just been reached. I mean, there, there are debates. It doesn't really matter, because we're talking about a five, ten year period for most. Oil, and that's the, the graph which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The peak oil has been reached in effect. Now, it doesn't mean that the oil is running out. That's ludicrous. Of course, it's not running out. But what it means is that oil is going to be more difficult to get. It's going to be more expensive. You're dragging out a shale. It's going to be deep sea exploration and so on. Um, and also, um, of course, the, the associated problem is not that there will be less oil and it's going to get more expensive. The problem is, of course, that demand is skyrocketing. At the moment, that is the uh, process of consumption. The United States gets about the thunder a quarter of all oil, it uses a quarter of all oil. Um, New Zealand, good old New Zealand, comes in at number 67 in the charts with a very low consumption of oil. Good old New Zealand, great. But even better than Australia, which is even better, I think. But when you look at this, you can see that the per capita figures are not quite as cosy because um, New Zealand is using somewhere around 38 uh, barrels a day per capita or per thousand people. Um, higher than the UK, and of course much higher than China and India. Much, much higher. Eight, six, eight times as much. Now, if we look at what's happening in China and India, you can see how this is likely to change. These are the projections for oil consumption uh, over that period of uh, up to 2030. Um, for those of you that can't see, this sort of uh, beige figure at the bottom is, is India. And the red one is China, and the top one, blue, is the United States. So if you look at the figure on the right here, projected oil consumption, by uh, 2030, India is expected to almost double its consumption of, uh, of oil, and China slightly less. So we are going to be moving into a situation where the demand for oil is likely to increase dramatically, and this means, I think, two things. It means, firstly, of course, that the price is going to go up. And the second thing it means that the competition globally for this resource is going to get much more aggressive. I mean, you don't have to be an expert in foreign affairs to see that Libya is not just about human rights. So the kind of conflict that we're going to, or we are likely to see globally, uh, over not only oil but other raw materials, is likely to significantly increase. And you can see how this has worked out just recently over, over this last uh, 12 or so months. Um, the figures there are for Brent oil and for West Texas crude, West Texas intermediate. And you can just see how oil prices react dramatically um, to the uh, industry, or rather to the market's perception of what's going to happen. Quite dramatic increases. Uh, at its peak, uh, which was about 18 months, two years ago, Brent was about $160 a barrel, US dollars a barrel. It's gone down and fluctuated and so on. We're now up to about $118, $120. Um, it's quite easy to see how that could increase by 20, 30, 40 percent very, very quickly over a very short period of time. And the knock-on uh, effect of that in terms of fuel prices is going to be dramatic, 
but also in terms of virtually everything else, because of course, foodstuffs, virtually everything you buy has a major oil content. And of course, the thing is, forecasts can be wrong. The forecasts that we look at, which are quite dramatic, saying, you know, oil's going to get more expensive and so on, because if you read through the, um, the, the, the oil industry predictions, you can see that everyone's agreeing that oil price is going to increase. Nobody's saying uh, how much exactly, but they're all saying it's going to increase. Some say it's going to be quite substantial as this. So. But almost without exception, the predictions have been wrong, as you would expect. But they've all been wrong the wrong way. Yeah? The price of oil's gone up much more than people would expect for all sorts of reasons. Partly this is due to speculation, partly it's due to uh, currency exchange, because oil is priced in US dollars and so on. But fundamentally, it's due to the fact that there's going to be less of it around, it's going to be more expensive to get, and demand is going to get greater. And the impact on things like environmental planning, apart from questions of, of foodstuff and lifestyle, are going to be quite substantial. <coughs> so, what do we know? What we do know is that oil, gas, and other mobile energy sources will become more expensive and less readily available. I think we have to accept that's something that's going to be the case. We also have to expect that food prices are likely to increase globally. For a whole bunch of reasons. Partly through speculation. There is substantial speculation in food stuffs, as we know. But of course, because food prices are so closely linked to oil, uh, then that is likely to increase. And of course, demand is increasing. Because as the Chinese middle class emerges, the Indian middle class becomes bigger, then their demand for the kind of things that you're producing here increases. And that might be good for New Zealand, but of course, uh, globally. The impact might be slightly different. And of course, as I've said, international competition for resources, uh, global resources, natural resources, will become much more aggressive. Our response to this, it seems to me, is that we need to nurture what I'm calling greater societal resilience to unwanted and unexpected change. We've got to start looking ahead and thinking, what are we going to do when these things happen? How are we going to deal with it? And the fundamental position here is, it is unlikely that we are going to be able to carry on in the way in which we've carried on over the last 10, 20 or 30 years. We cannot expect to do that. And that doesn't apply just to New Zealand, it applies to all of the post-industrial societies. So, that's my first kind of, let's go and split our wrist, uh, <laughs> uh, What's going on in the world? That's our first challenge. The second challenge, though, is sustainable development. And, of course, this is a vocabulary for policy making. Everybody's in favour of it. Very difficult to be against it. You know, everyone's in favour of sustainable development. We all tick the box and say, yes, it's a good thing. Whether we actually do anything about it is another question. The rhetoric is great, the action is often slightly less. But that quote up there is the, the famous quote from the Brundtland Report that many of you will know about from 1987. But there are two key elements here. It's about meeting the needs of the future, future generations. It's about asking the question, it seems to me, can we continue to do this indefinitely? Can we continue to do this indefinitely? If the answer to that is no, then it raises serious questions about whatever it is we're doing. But two elements here. One is the question about the essential needs of the world's poor, to which overriding priority should be given. We have moral responsibility. We're pretty prosperous, we're quite comfortable, but the Brother Report quite rightly is saying we have this moral responsibility. And secondly, there is the idea of limitations imposed by the state of technology on the environment's ability to meet our needs. In other words, there are limits. There are absolute limits to what we can do. So, where does this take us? Well, sustainability is, is not a thing. It's a way of doing things. It's a way of thinking. In the public sector, in local government, for example, I keep saying to people, you've got to regard this a bit like the profit motive in private industry. Okay? If, if, if the private sector does not have a profit motive, it isn't deeply imbued in the organisations, then the organisation doesn't work. That's what ceases to be effective. By the same token, we need to establish sustainable development, sustainability as a way of doing things in all of our public organisations and private as well, but certainly in our public organisations. Asking the question, can we can do this? Can we do whatever it is indefinitely? It's a, an agenda for resilience, being resilient to change, and like freedom and democracy, it's an overarching societal value. We're all in favour of it, but we've got different definitions about exactly what it is. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a political agenda. Not a technical one, it's a political agenda. We're fundamentally in the role of politics here. Deciding on our collective futures, common futures and fates, and how we deal with them and address them. And we need to take it seriously for two reasons. One, because we're altruistic and responsible. We do care about other people. We do care about, as yet, unborn generations. Although, as I'm saying to you, actually, we care about our kids. And my kids are going to have to deal with all these things we're talking about. But fundamentally, we are also needing to take this seriously because we are self-interested. 
All this is about self-interest. It's not some airy-fairy notion about dealing with the future, about kind of cuddly polar bears and doing so about whales. Those things are important. But what we're actually talking about here is how we're going to survive over the next 30 years. How are we going to deal with these things? We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our children. Now, one key element of all this is fair shares. And I'll try and explain why I think this is fundamental to lead to our, our discussion. I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the idea of the ecological footprint. The number of hectares of productive land or sea required to support one person at the average level of consumption. It's, it's a kind of very simplified mechanism for understanding what our impact is on the world's resources. As you can see from this simple uh, uh, chart, the United States needs somewhere in the region of five planets to support its lifestyle. New Zealand's docking around about three, two and a half, three. It's about the same. And then down the bottom, of course, India and China are getting less than their fair share. I mean, you don't have to be a kind of uh, uh, an economist to understand that some people are getting a bigger share of the cake than others. Now, this might be fine, all well and good, and all well and dandy, but there are problems with this. And let's just sort of see a, an example. London happens to be the city where I was born and grew up. London's ecological footprint is 49 million global hectares, 293 times its size. There's no such thing as a sustainable city, it's an oxymoron. Cities are dependent upon their territory, upon their land, the resources for water, for food, energy, and all the rest of it. But it means that each London resident needs 6.63 global hectares, some in the region of about three planets. And of course, within London, the rich demand even more or demand slightly less. And some people in London, for that matter, often probably need the equivalent of a theoretical six or seven planets in order to support their lifestyle. So this does create, I think, a number of issues that we need to address. If we were to get anywhere near sustainable, anywhere near a fair share, these are the kind of reductions that are calculated for Europe. Now we might, you know, we might negotiate this, we might argue the detail and all the rest of it, but whichever way you want to cut this and slice it, it is a dramatic reduction in resources. So if we're talking about sustainability in public documents, in government documents, in local government documents, what we're actually talking about is this. And as you can imagine, if you were to get these kinds of reductions in consumption, they would have phenomenal impact, absolutely phenomenal impact in how we live our lives and what we do. So we can't just, as it were, flippantly say sustainability is important, we sign up. It's not about just going down to the recycling centre and dropping the wine bottles into the box. It's much more substantial than that, it seems to me. And it's even worse. I'm really going to depress you. Um, when you start looking at things like biocapacity and relating it to uh, sustainability, you, you start to get a, an interesting combination. Biocapacity, the capacity of any area, given area, to generate an ongoing supply of renewable resources and to absorb waste. Unsustainability occurs if the area's eco footprint exceeds its biocapacity. That's New Zealand. New Zealand's biocapacity has been declining since the 60s, quite dramatically. Um, which is quite interesting, I think. I mean, you know, as I said, I've only been in six months, so I can't give you a detailed explanation of why this is so. I'm sure there are people in the room who can. Um, but nevertheless, in terms of the relationship between biocapacity and environmental e e ecological footprint, which is the bottom uh, line, you're not doing too badly in those terms. But of course, your eco footprint is still way in excess of what it should be. It should be right down here, around about two. A fair share would be an eco footprint of about 2.2 going down as the world increases in size. Obviously, the eco footprint goes down. But just to make you feel better, look at the United States. The United States stopped being sustainable in terms of its own country about 40 years ago. And to make you even feel better than that, look at Switzerland. I don't think they've ever been sustainable. Wow. You know? So, bear in mind the eco footprint. The other element that I want to, to address here is quality of life. Uh, the United Nations uses the HDI, the Human Development Index, as a proxy for quality of life, and it's things like child mortality, access to health, education, and so on. The basic conditions of quality of life, it's not about ownership of flat screen televisions, Mercedes, and Levi James. It's not about consumption, it's about the basic, as it were, elements. And if you look at the HDI throughout the world, as you would expect, um, the red colours are those places with a high quality of life, and the dark blue colours are those places with a, a low quality of life. And it's more or less as you would uh, anticipate, um, not knowing about it. And if you look at the HDI rankings for the last year, you can see, uh, glory, glory, New Zealand comes in in the charts at number three. 
And the only downside about that is that you're third and you see uh, uh, Australia is second. <laughs> United Kingdom, quite a way down. China, 89. And then, of course, people right down the bottom, countries right down the bottom, mainly in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the, the important thing here is that these basic conditions of quality of life surely have got to be a global objective. They're, they're objective of the United Nations Millennium Goals and so on. So, at least in terms of declared policy, the, 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 the global community is committed to the idea of improving quality of life for all those countries down the bottom. And if you look at what's happening, for example, in China and in India, the kind of green line is, white green line is, is, is uh, China, the yellow one is India. You can see that over the last 30 to 40 years, there has been quite a substantial increase in their uh, human development index. Now, there was the quality of life has been improving, which is great. I mean, surely we all applaud that. That's important. But we have to bear in mind that that quality of life improvement comes at a cost in terms of raw materials, in terms of access to sources, because of course you're building hospitals, you're building schools, you're putting roads in and all the rest of it. So these things are not, as it were, resource free. So whilst we applaud it and we support it and all the rest of it, we have to recognise that the resources involved are really quite substantial. Oh, wrong. It's the wrong way, isn't it? What am I doing? Here we are. Oh, I'm going backwards. So, let me draw you a little graph or graph, depending upon which social class you belong to. I'm calling these sustainability trajectories. On the, on the horizontal um, axis, we're going to put the HDI, the Human Development Index, which runs basically from 0 to 10. 0 to 0 0.9 or something. Nobody actually gets up to, up to 10. And on the vertical axis, we're going to put global hectares per person, basically the eco footprint running up from about 2 to about 5. Now, a sustainable fair share, if everybody had a fair share in terms of the uh, global hectares per person, the footprint, it'll be about 2, 2.2, fair share. So we start plotting countries on there. We put that nice yellow blob. Most of the so-called developing world, the underdeveloped world, the south, whatever phrase you want to use, is going to be right down there. By and large, their impact upon the environment in terms of resource usage is pretty low. Very low, in fact. They're getting much less than their fair share. But, of course, their position in terms of the HDI, in terms of quality of life, is also low. So, what have we got? We've got a, a current model of development where the global south wants to be like the north. They want to be like New Zealand. They want to be like Australia and America. They want access to all the consumer goodies. They want access to the hospitals, the schools, the roads, the cars, the air travel, and all the rest of it. Quite understandable. That's the global model of development. But of course, that blue blob up there is unfortunately associated with a big black cloud. Because that big black cloud says high quality of life, but high envir environmental costs. It's not sustainable in the long term. Can we continue to do this indefinitely? Short sure answer, no, we can't. So what are we going to do? We've got to think about an alternative model. And the alternative model, of course, as you would expect, is that. Nice green little blob. High quality of life, low environmental costs. Now you might say to me, yeah, well, this is all very well, you know, uh, naive, uh, unachievable, uh, etc., etc., etc. I think this diagram is saying two things. It's saying, firstly, that it is impossible for the whole world to live at that standard. It's impossible. It can't be done. There aren't the resources. And yet, if we want the majority of the world's population to have a high quality of life, maybe a different quality of life, but still a high quality of life, what we've got to do is persuade those economies to go this way, to reduce their impact on the environment. But why would they do that when we're up there? So it's a two-fold process. It's about encouraging and supporting China, India, Brazil and Africa to go this way, whilst at the same time dragging that blue balloon down here, changing our pattern of life. And my argument will be to you that changing our pattern of life is important for two reasons. It's important, one, for the political reason of, it, of demonstrating to the rest of the world that we're serious about this. But secondly, and perhaps crucially, we're going to have to do it. We are going to have to do it. And if we don't do it, we are going to be in trouble. Gosh, I've been talking too long. What does this mean for New Zealand? New Zealand has got lots of advantages. It's got space, it's got 60-70% renewable electricity, 
It's got a strong, if declining biocapacity, I think positive environmental awareness. Uh, small population, which is a fantastic advantage. Um, Kiwi ingenuity, have we told about this? Number eight wire. Yeah? I'm sure this is, uh, this is uh, public relations. But nevertheless, it might be important. And of course, small towns. From where I'm coming from in terms of environmental planning, that is tremendously important. Small towns are manageable. You can get dialogue going, civic engagement, and all the rest of it. Much more difficult if you're in Beijing, where the conurbation of Beijing is 30 million people. But New Zealand's got urban sprawl and selling of land. I'm working in Hamilton. Best example of urban sprawl I've seen outside the United States. An untenable eco footprint, high carbon output, declining biocapacity, exporting raw materials. Somebody tells me all that valuable coal that comes across and grown out to Christchurch and going to Japan is stored in the sea, somebody told me. I don't know if this is right. Um, you know, the Japanese realise that this is a, a, a valuable raw material that's going to run out. What do you do with it? What do you store it? Keep it? Keep it in the sea. A rising population and an ageing population and loss of productive agricultural land. Certainly where I'm working and living now in Hamilton, um, we're building houses in some of the most productive agricultural land in the world. Certainly in the country, not the world. How should we respond to these things? Well, um, at the level of government, I am staggered. I'm absolutely staggered that there is no national spatial and land use capacity. I, I find it incomprehensible. You know, but every country in the world has got one. They're, they're very quality. There is no national urban strategy for design matters. Um, there is limited support and resources for local government. I mean, from my work in Europe, I know that when you've got good, strong local government, then you do things. You do really good things. Conversely, as in my country, when you've got a very weak and limited local government, it's much more difficult. The Resource Management Act, I'm beginning to understand, is not actually designed to do the things that we need to do. As far as I can understand it, uh, it has a focus which is inappropriate. I'll talk about that uh, if you like. And the recognition that 100% pure is the urban as well as the rural environment. Um, I, I mean, you don't come to New Zealand for the quality of the urban architecture. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I mean, this is a lovely camp. Lovely. But I'm sorry, I'm living in Hamilton, I can assure you. But anyway, um, but, but, but the point is, you know, that, that, that the 100% pure, the environment, is about, yes, it's about the wonderful landscapes that you have in this country. The wonderful environment, fantastic. Uh, but it's also about maintaining good, high quality urban character and urban life as part of that. Oh, yes. Well, um, I, I don't know if I'm offending anyone here, but there's a lot of this kind of stuff around Hamilton. Automobile suburbs, they are not sustainable. I mean, visually they're appalling. When I first saw this, I took this photo, and, and it, it reminded me of a South African township. It reminded me of Hamilton, I said, okay, you know, sort of a level, nothing sticking up, very good trees, no churches, no spires, you know, virtually everything concreted over, little tiny bits of green around. I mean, that kind of section development is absolutely appalling. The sprawl, no public transportation, no access other than by motor car and so on and so forth. Let me talk a little bit about sprawl because I got quite excited about this, uh, as you can imagine, looking um, around. In the cities, the most energy frugal. We know that higher densities mean better access to services, you get better public transport operation. There are clearly limits. Those limits are around about 140, 150 persons per, per uh, hectare. Hamilton City, 15 persons per hectare. 15! Mumbai, 295. Now, I'm not suggesting we should get to Mumbai, but we do need perhaps to secure change. This is a very famous uh, chart uh, from uh, Peter Newman Kimberley in, in Australia from the, the late 80s. It's quoted again and again and again. All the research that's been done supports it. But if you can see these kind of purpley blobs up here, that's Australia. And I suspect if you were to put uh, most New Zealand towns uh, in there, they'd be about around here. In other words, low density, high transportation costs. Whereas here, Europe, Europe is around about 50, 75, going up to about 100. And of course, down here, Hong Kong, very, very high density. I'm not suggesting we should be looking at Hong Kong. But densification of cities in New Zealand seems to me almost a no-brainer. However, because of the character of your development here, single story on single plots, it's a challenge. It's a major challenge. I've been talking to Hamilton City Council about that. How are you going to do it? So what's the debate we've been having, I've been having so far? What does it mean? We've got to secure significant reductions in overall energy use. There is no question that it's going to have to happen. Your budget prices are going to increase. At the moment in the UK, 
Uh, we're paying about the equivalent of three New Zealand dollars per litre. We're paying two. You're going to be paying three very soon, and probably four or five. That's going to happen. We have to be aware it's going to happen. It might happen in three years or five years, but it's not going to be 20 years. We need energy descent plans. We need to eradicate carbon lock-in. We need to restrict car usage, including parking. And all these things are sort of against the New Zealand birthright. You know? Uh, the idea that you know, you've got complete mobility, the idea, what is it, a quarter of an acre, an acre, an acre, a bottom, and this kind of stuff. All of that, it seems to me, is going to be under threat. Um, promotion of public transport, urban containment, eco densification, the idea that you densify with ecological principles like they're doing in Vancouver and similar places, changing building rates. Why on earth, why on earth do you not have building regulations that say you must put solar hot water on every new house? Seems so obvious. Why not? Sunshine you've got so cheap, you know. Uh, the figures I've seen suggest that all of New Zealand's hot water in the summer could come from solar, no problem. And meso and micro renewable energy, meso uh, uh, micro is, is obviously uh, uh, photovoltaic cells and solar in individual houses, wind turbines. Meso is, is the idea of having uh, ground source heat pumps or, uh, or turbines and community centres, schools, and so on and so forth. Now, you need a portfolio approach to energy generation. You've got this great advantage in New Zealand, you've got the big hydroelectric schemes and so on, but you are going to need more <clears throat> because those hydroelectric schemes are going to need renewable, need renewing at some point in time. Very quickly, what I'm trying to argue to you here is in terms of my professional interest of planning, we've got to think differently. Land use, town planning, all the kind of phrases that we use historically are no longer useful. We can't just be talking about the land. We've got to have a different approach and a different way of understanding, a new way of working towards our environment. Because environmental and planning implies a number of things for me. Holistic approaches. You can't just look at the town and the countryside. The two are inextricably linked. We've got to plan those two together. The phrase that's used in Europe is territorial cohesion. Bringing together the town, bringing together the rural areas, and making sure that you are actually planning those two environments together. We have to be aware of what's happening globally. We can't just be New Zealand, we can't just be France. We've got to work within a global environment. The idea of cosmopolitanism is that we are no longer citizens of New Zealand, we are citizens of the world. What happens in Libya impacts upon us here. What happens in Africa impacts upon us here. We have to be aware of that. We have to look ahead. Planning is about looking ahead. Civic engagement, it cannot be done by telling people what to do. People have to be engaged in this process. There have to be mechanisms of governance to enable this to happen. Places where you're getting real success in terms of change are places where they've got these processes of governance and civic engagement. And it's about fairness, as I was trying to argue to you in that, uh, uh, that diagram with the bubbles. It is about fairness. And if we don't accept that, then we're going to have to be militarily quite strong because we're going to have to fight off a lot of other people who want what we've got. And we're going to have to fight for the things that we need, literally fight. And we need the political leadership for that. We don't have it in the UK. I have a strong suspicion that you don't have it here. And sustainability and resilience seem to me to be tremendously important. So very, very quickly to conclude, that's the kind of things that we're going to have to expect. Our prosperity is going to be eroded. Fossil fuels are going to be more expensive. Food's going to be more expensive. Raw materials are going to be more difficult to get. And although the timelines for the above are not clear, they are likely to be much shorter than we currently think. It is not in the long distance future. It is closer than we think. So, the long boom's over. Harold Macmillan, um, the British Prime Minister in 1959, said, you've never had it so good. Never had it so good. And he was right. And actually, it got better. It actually got better in the 1960s and 1970s. Terrific. In the 1980s. But... My argument to you is that the long boom is over. and We need to rethink how we live our lives, how we plan our lives. And I think, crucially, if we wait until we need to change, we probably won't be able to afford it. If we leave it, it will be in serious trouble. If we start planning for it now, then we might be able to weather the storm. She'll be right. <laughs> no, she probably won't be. That's the problem, you know? If we just say that, she'll be right. Yeah, we might be in trouble. So I don't think we, all our cars are going to be in that sort of position. Um, that's Picton, down in the South Island. But I certainly think we're going to have to rethink and reimagine a different future. Right? It won't be the same, but I think our ingenuity, our knowledge, our science, our technology, and our skills can produce us a different way of living with a different quality of life that will be just as good. And I'd like to finish on the sunset. So thank you very much.
Thanks very much indeed, Bob. Uh, Bob's actually agreed to uh, respond to some questions, and uh, I invite the audience to uh, participate in the discussion for the next 10 minutes or so. Ian. Well, thank you very much for that. What, what would you say would be the immediate implications for tertiary education? Oh. <laughs> oh goodness me I mean I'm not sure it's my, my remit to talk about that but um, as I said I think we need to think differently and our job as teachers in higher education is to make young people aware of that because they are the people who are going to have to deal with this yeah? not, I mean I'm, I'm going to be pushing up the daisies it's not going to be impacted on me but you know, the young people who are here today, they are going to have to deal with these problems. And I think we've got to help them by equipping them with the knowledge and the understanding to, to do that. And also, I would say, to encourage them to be much more political and be aware of politics and participate in politics. We've, we've got to really fight the democratic, democratic deficit, deficit and um, encourage young people to understand that politics is important and it isn't just about the things that you know, grey old men do in suits. Please. Uh, yes, please. Um, I keep hearing about things like glaciers that are getting bigger and uh, the whole thing to uh, you know, put up. But what about that? Is that all? I don't know what that means, really, to be honest with you. It's too weird about them. I can't tell you where they are, but I've read that, you know, some glaciers are getting bigger. And... Well, in my view, the, the scientific evidence, um, which has been exhaustively short, is quite clear. That's what I've been hearing today, but I keep hearing the other thing that tells well, me that there, 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 there are high profile contractors, yes, who say there's global warming in many places. But I think it's true to say that global warming in the scientific um, community is absolutely clear about this. Mm. There, there may be debates about how quickly, you know, and exactly what the effects are. But there's, in my view, no, no question. You, you know, go to these governmental uh, climate change. Yeah, I know, right, I, yeah, I'm just not understanding how a glacier over here can get um, bigger and well for the rest of the rest of the world's freedom. But I can't understand that. David. Bob, I'm in the same sort of age cohort as you are. Um, what, what strikes me as curious is that, that when I was at university, we had um, the club of Rome, we had the limits to growth, we had Malthusian. Um, population projections, and in some ways your, your model of throughput, at, at one level you can make your system as more efficient, but aggregate demand on population is so important, yet for some reason, um, and I'd like you to perhaps enlighten me on this, but the whole question of overpopulation or the world's population has dropped right off the political agenda, particularly in the last 15 years. Well, I, I suppose the short answer to that is two points. One is that as far as I understand it, most conventional demographic projections suggest that the population is going to peak around about nine, nine and a half. Um, the the like this. Um, this recent United Nations report says it's going to be higher, but as I understand it, that's, that's kind of uh, extremely good. Uh, and the second thing is, okay, we might say there are too many people, but what can we do about it? You know, I mean, it's not as if we can um, adopt policies globally dramatically impact upon them. And in a way, it's not the totality of the number of people, it's the way in which the demands of the, that population are going to increase as they become more prosperous and they want to you know, they want to get into more cars and all the rest of it. Um, but what I don't understand, it's quite possible for us to feed a population of 9 billion, 9.5 billion, and house a house population of 9.5 billion, but it's not possible to do it in the way in which we are approaching the moment. Question there. Does that follow then that current economic theory is completely flawed and we should be teaching it to the opposite way? Well, I mean, I'm not in common. Um, I suppose if you were to uh, deal with classic capitalist economics, you would have a different perspective on all of this. Um, I, 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 I suppose the response to that is if you are teaching economics, you need to take this into account. That's what I can suggest. I mean, I, uh, in terms of what an economic syllabus might be, I'm not qualified to judge. But I'd like to say, what I would say to you is, in my view, 
this one is serious and we have to take it seriously. But economics doesn't tell people how to think, it just tries to explain how people think. I suppose it does in some So it's just saying, oh, yeah, supply and demand. So do we need to like, revisit the dialogue around quality of life? We can say, oh, we're really rich, but we're probably stressed out, everyone's for themselves. And we, we're not even, we're, this is, as far as we're concerned now, people in this room, we're living a great life, and why should we change it? We do things because we can. Um, we, we, we're, we're not going to experience a world where individual changes are going to, as it were, correct results in that world. I mean, we, we do, we, we, we fly, we drive our cars, we consume, because we can do it. I mean, you can't blame people for doing it, you know? And you can't blame people for saying, I want to continue doing it. You know, I want the big U turn, I want the car, I want, you know, All I'm saying is that um, at the level of politics, uh, politicians have a responsibility to look ahead and plan for what is likely to happen. Somebody said to me, uh, a guy from Auckland, he's a musician, and I think, you know, quite, quite a, um, a thoughtful man. I, I met him in, a, in a, um, a hostel, you know, a, BY, a, a backpacker's place. And he said, you know, he said, we're living in 1938. He said, there is a sense of uh, collective self-denial. We're living in 1938. I can't use that analogy in Europe, but I can use it here. You know? And I think that's a very powerful analogy. We're not really looking at what's going to happen. That's what it's Well, um, I'm interested in your graph where you're understandably talking about the need to have um, low environmental impact while allowing high quality of life. Well, that's, of course, is the, is the silver bullet. So, what's in the silver bullet? Well, I suppose you've got a cocktail doing something. I mean, we cannot imagine a high consumption society where we're buying things and throwing them away. There's no one answer to this, it's not in the moment for now. We cannot live in a society where we're continually using fossil fuel. We cannot live in a society where we're continually wasting. You know, and so on. I mean, the whole of that kind of ecological agenda, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which everybody, I'm sure, understands and thinks of, um, is the agenda that we're going to need to adopt. And we just cannot, as a society, any society, continue to waste, continue to consume. If we just simply ask the question, can we continue to do this indefinitely? The invariable the answer is probably no. We can continue to use energy, but you know, let's use less. You know, let's use a lot less. We're profitable. You are here. Electricity here, I can't, I can't believe it. In, in terms of like trying to like, plan for it though, is it worth thinking about those things as symptoms of a problem or a separate problem? The problem is that we are we are going to hit a brick wall. If I'm right, we are going to hit a brick wall. If we plan for that brick wall, we can deal with it. We reduce our energy consumption, we plan more for renewable energy, we think about our resources, we think about how we operate, how we plan our cities, and we plan our environment, if we think about all those things carefully into a context of less resources, yeah, then we might survive. If we continue to consume, you know, why are we building great big roads? Uh, Nick? Uh, my, my question's a little cheeky, and answer it as seriously or as lightheartedly as you like, but uh, I was interested in why you came to New Zealand. Was it... Um, um, be, because it, it, it's a bigger challenge or because it offered you a better life? Well, <laughs> my, my advice is to ask him why he came to this. New Zealand coffee is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Ali, you had a question. Uh, <clears throat> well, in your presentation, First half of the presentation, you put a lot of emphasis on the issue of inequality at the global level, at the national, at the regional, and local level. And you highlighted that the challenge is political, it's not technological or scientific in the narrow scientific sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in, in the second part of your presentation and your conclusion, you shied away from the implications of what you are arguing. Um, if the challenge is political and the problem is inequality and distribution of wealth and resources, how do we deal with that in the context of the current economic political systems that we have at the global level, at the national level, at the regional level? Yeah. For example, in Christchurch, Christchurch is a specially segregated city between East and West. Okay? 
uh, in the current context of, of rebuilding of rebuilding Christchurch and addressing the issues that are facing the city, uh, the issue of inequality hasn't been addressed. If we are going to rebuild the city without increasing the global footprint of the city, then the only way we can do it is by redistrib redistributing wealth and resources. But that's off the political agenda. Nobody wants to talk about that. No, no you're, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I agree with, with, with everything you said. I mean, if you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about a political agenda, and you are talking absolutely about questions of equity. I mean, the, see, in, the, in the 1960s, when we were at universities, there was a lot of talk about know, those issues, and there was a lot of radicalism in thinking yeah. amongst the student population, amongst the academic yeah. yeah. staff. But now, everybody has become so middle of the road. Nobody yeah. wants to talk about these difficult challenges. No. No, I, I mean, I agree with you, and I, I, you're, you're quite right, I, I, uh, I shied away from that. Um, environmental degradation and economic explo exploitation tend to go hand in hand, those two tend to go hand in hand. And the um, questions of environmental justice are fundamental to any kind of future that we have. Uh, whether or not we can get that on the political agenda, when there are very powerful interests which are opposed to that, is, is another question. Um, I, I don't have a simple answer to, to your question. I don't. I'd like to, but I don't. But all I can say is that, um, from, from my own perspective, these things are important, these things have to be addressed, and I'll tell as many people as possible that they are important things. And I'll try and encourage as many people as possible to uh, respond in a proactive and positive way to them. But I don't have a simple political answer in terms of organisation about it. But you're, you're absolutely right. OK, I'm going to take one last question from there. Um, very briefly mentioned the RNA and the thought that the private was wrong. Well, I, ha I have to preface this by saying that I've only been here for six months. Uh, and as I understand it, the, the uh, land use planning regulations, the town planning regulations and, and, and legislation that existed before the RMA was very much based upon the UK experience and very much on that practice. As I understand it now, um, there is a talk, and this is talking to people working in Hamilton City and in practice, they're saying they don't have the, 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 the levers, the regulatory mechanisms to control design, to control density, to control a whole bunch of things, uh, in, to control sprawl that they really need. And as I understand it, the RMA, although that when the RMA was, was first published um, in the UK, we were saying, that this looks great, we really like this, it's fantastic. But I, I, as I understand it, the recognition now is that the, the, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. And although there are many good and positive things about the way in which the RMA works, that uh, much of the land use regulation and control, which is fundamental to planning cities and controlling sprawl, has, has been lost. But there was a strong political agenda underpinning sure. the RMA. I'm sure. The whole idea was to, to have more markets and less And that's why, Ali, we're not going to debate the RMA tonight. <laughs> um, I'm going to bring this to a, a, a conclusion. The, um, I'd just like, on your behalf, to, to thank Bob Evans for his uh, very interesting presentation. I think it's important for us uh, frequently to look at the global situation in the context of what we face locally, and I think the, uh, I mean, I think Ali actually made the uh, uh, the right kinds of statements about our local dilemma in a sense, because what's happening in Canterbury at the moment, we know all these global issues, or some of us know quite a lot of them. Uh, we've got an opportunity to apply some principles here um, in a city that uh, needs to recover, uh, but we're dri driven by massive social issues about making sure that people have got somewhere to live. Um, we're not necessarily going to give absolute priority, and maybe the politicians are not going to give absolute priority to what is in the best long-term interests of Christchurch. They'll take some shortcuts, and I think that's uh, unfortunate, and uh, I'd hope that uh, Lincoln University and those of you that are here tonight uh, will be able to continue to participate in that debate as we try and rebuild uh, this province but it's certainly my pleasure Bob to uh, thank you for your insights and uh, 
I find it extraordinary to think that you've been here at least uh, twice as uh, half, half the length of time as Nick um, in terms of uh, coming from the UK. Um, I, that was a really naughty question because he, he's, he's a professor of ecology and he's only been here a very short period of time. <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we always value uh, what is effectively an international perspective focused uh, in part on, on our environment and we thank you for that.